Hi, everybody. Welcome to the webinar. Nice to see you all. <laughs> What's happening, people? <laughs> Loads of people in. Yeah, fantastic. Um, so just to say, <laughs> say, give us a hello in the chat. Maybe also let us know where you're joining us from. We'll see who's joining us from the furthest away. Uh, maybe let us know if you've done BYMT before in the chat as well. It's just nice to know. Newcastle, Leeds. If we know you, maybe All the northern let us people. Know. Sheffield, Midlands, Glasgow, <laughs> Scotland, Portsmouth. Too fast, too fast. <laughs> Sussex Island, Liverpool, Switzerland, Aberdeen, Oh, Kent. Max Hunter. Hello, Max from Max. Aberdeen. That's someone we know. Sup, Max. Um, where else? Monmouth, Berkshire, Malta, Paris, Paris Birmingham. From Someone Moray. was in extinction this summer, but it's gone. Okay, right, we'll stop saying hello. No, to... I just got to list all of them. <laughs> um, so, uh, my name is Rachel Birch Lawson. Sorry, and I'm Kyle Eccles. Um, and we are here today to talk about all things dance related. Um, so, we thought the best thing to do would be to start by introducing ourselves a little bit on what we do. Um, I can stop people saying there have been in shows that we've done, so welcome all of you. <laughs> welcome back. Um, and Sup, crew. Um, and then we thought we'd kind of, there's a couple of topics we can cover, but obviously we want to really answer your questions as much as possible and then to yeah. maybe shape it with a few a few thoughts we had. So to start by introducing yourself, shall I go first? Yeah, you go first. Um, so I am a choreographer, a movement director, a director of movement work, which is slightly different, a performer, a teacher, a researcher, a lecturer, an academic, all in dance. <laughs> so I do lots and lots of different things, um, a lot of kind of different jobs, different organisations. Um, I make work which tours internationally, both work that I self-produce that we dance in. We've worked together for about 10 years now. Uh, I'm making work for BYMT and lots of other companies. I make work for other companies and I also teach. So at the moment, I'm a teaching fellow at Guildford School of Acting, where I teach in the BA Acting and the BA Dance programmes. And I also teach on the Trinity Lab and Master Choreography programme, where I'm an academic supervisor and lecturer. So that's kind of what I'm doing right now in life. Um, <laughs> quite a lot. Um, over to you, Kyle. This is the point where on a project, I usually just look at everybody sternly and go, you'll get to know who I am. But that won't really work here, so I'll, I'll introduce myself nicely. Um, so my name is Kyle Eccles. I've worked with Rachel for about 10 years as a performer and a maker, a uh, collaborator. Um, I, I teach at many different places across the UK and abroad. So I teach at uh, Erdang, I teach at Laban. I previously taught at London Contemporary Dance School. I teach at the Zagreb Academy of Dramatic Arts. Um, where else do I teach? London Studio Centre. In the past. Studio Centre I've taught in the past. Cat Schemes. Cat Schemes in Dance East. So I teach all around the place, primarily from a healthier performer point of view. So the other side of my work but as, as a dancer, I trained at Rombert, so I've come up through a kind of traditional training track um, through Rombert, through into performance and stunts and circus, so I've got all that side as well. The other side of my career and my life is as a strength conditioning coach for dancers. So that means that I'm often looking at prehabilitation rather than rehabilitation. So if you're already broken, I give you to a, a physio, but I'm looking at you before, I'm trying not to make you break. So I look at the strength conditioning of um, performers, primarily focusing on contemporary dancers. Um, and I use the information there to lecture. So I lecture also on foundation courses, uh, undergraduate dance courses, dance science, BSc, master's courses over at Trinity Laban. So I do lots of lecturing on physiology. And what all that means is that also in this call, we can talk a little bit about health, well-being, injury prevention, that kind of thing, um, which I'm sure is important for lots of you who are wanting to go into dance as a career. Um, just say a bit about our involvement with, y with the BYMT. Um, I've been working for BYMT since 2007. That was my first ever project with them. And I've basically worked for them every year since, making lots and lots of shows. The main thing we've done together is the Dance Connection program, which is a BYMT's kind of movement-led strand of musical theatre. So we create those shows together with a really amazing team. And I've also been on the audition tour for about five or six years. So I may have met some of you on the audition tour in the past. Anyway, so that's a little bit about us. So from all of that, um, are there any specific questions that have come up? I can see one's already popped up in the queue. Any specific questions or anything you want to ask about what we do and how we've trained? Oh. Okay, so Rebecca has asked, what movement skills do you teach at drama schools through acting and how can I develop these movement skills? Good question. Okay, so that's probably one more for me. Um, so actually, GSA obviously is the only, the only real drama school I've taught at recently. I have in the past taught at Guildhall School of Music and Drama as well, where I did actual choreography for musicals for their acting students. 
Um, at the moment at GSA, I teach contact improvisation, which is a really crucial skill. Lots of physical theatre companies are using that now. Companies like Frantic Assembly, um, those sorts of companies. But also it's about helping actors get really comfortable with their bodies. And I also work on things like character work, so how to portray a character through movement. Um, getting fit and strong, that's important for any performer to have stamina. If you're going to do eight shows a week, whether that's an actor or a dancer, you need to have lots of stamina. Um, and just helping to actors really understand their bodies so again they can be in tune with their bodies and stay injury free. So in terms of how you develop those skills, um, really that's something you'd learn at drama school, you don't need to worry too much, but the main thing I'd say is stay active, make sure you're someone who's um, moving a lot, so that might be running, gym workouts, dancing, yeah. um, yoga, whatever works for you, gymnastics, but just making sure that you're the kind of person that's really in touch with your body and um, kind of happy to have a go at movement that's a really important skill at drama school i think that's an important point there's a thing um a term i've been researching really recently called physical literacy and what this means is having a broad variety of movement capability so if you are a dancer and you just dance and you've never rock climbed or skateboarded or done swimming or have to run after a bus because you're always late or whatever it is that you do. These other movement skills are also what's going to help you develop the work rates we've just been talking about. So character work, um, physical embodiment of, of, of everything, but more variety of movement really does help. So it's not just about doing the, the things that we train in. So it's not just dancing or acting. It's also going, let's go rock climbing today. And that does help. Mm. That's, that's for dancers as well as actors. So just really quickly, I'm going to power through the next few questions. Um, so what styles do you both train in? So I trained in ballet before till I was 18 and a bit of jazz and also Spanish dancing and flamenco. And then I went to London Contemporary Dance School and did my BA in contemporary dance. And since then, that's really been my focus, being contemporary mm. dance. Mine has been, I started in uh, martial arts, I did jujitsu, I did some gymnastics, did break hip dancing and hip hop. Um, I then went to rombe massively out of my depth doing ballet, uh, ballet and contemporary. And then I've done things with uh, circus and stunts afterwards. Yeah, so again, as you can see quite a big range and that's really helped us have a really varied and interesting career. Okay, that's from Meg, so from Sophie. Um, how can we learn to pick up choreography Whoa, better? lots of questions. There's loads, we're gonna fly through. It's gonna be super quick fire. Um, pick up choreography better. So, so uh, Sophia, I think, Sophia, um, I'm terrible at picking up choreography. It's something I've always struggled with. And for me, you also have to consider that it's not just whether I'm good or bad, but I have dyslexia. And my specific dyslexia prevents me from actually taking big sequences in. So for me, it's about being comfortable in my ability to go wrong. So I can't always be the person who gets it first. Rachel is somebody who can pick things up super quick. Yeah. So working together is hilarious. I think the main thing is that <laughs> it is important to work on that skill. And that's something you would yeah. train in it. But it's also important to understand that's not the only thing that makes you a good dancer. And if you can't pick up material fast, you can still have a very successful career. So not to stress too much about that. Um, and, being or, and also just it's one of those things that the more you do it the better you get that's really the only answer i hope that helps um should we skip down and see if there's any ones that we no um, we've got, we've got okay we, we can try and go through them all. uh where we're at we're at uh try, does movement and dance performing artsy performing arts i think that is <laughs> Type <laughs> of. artsy well, artsy commonly involve flexibility um as an involvement uh as movement involving dancers be flexible. so basically do you need to be flexible to train and to be a performer yes Yes, of course, because... Um... The short answer is yes, the long answer is no. Depending on what the movement is you want to do, obviously as a dancer, flexibility is going to be a really key part. And I work with lots of dancers who struggle with this, who think that if you're not flexible, then you can't be a successful dancer. It's, it can be really tough for your self-confidence and self-esteem if your flexibility, if your legs are coming all the way up here. Um, but it's not the the most essential part of being a dancer, being able to actually commit to movement and perform movement well in your range is, is really, really worth it. Flexibility um, often takes a little bit longer to come, um, depending also if you're growing at the minute, if you're, depending on how old you are, if you're constantly going through a growth spurt, then your body keeps after having to, to chase you as well. So flexibility does improve over time, but maybe not as quick as other things. And the other thing I would say as well is that fle some flexibility is important to reduce injury. So if you're very, very tight, then you can get um, injured more easily, which is something that Kyle talks about. But also if you're too flexible, you don't have the stability and you can get injured as well. So it's important to balance any flexibility training yeah. you do with strengthening training, making sure your joints are stable. I, so I, meet, I meet a lot of flexible dancers who are not very strong at all, and they've yes. relied on their flexibility to help them perform. And then when yes. we start doing arm movement work, they, they really struggle because they are they think they can just kick a leg up. So like everything we keep saying today, I feel like it's kind of yes and. 
Um, but what's important again is that you know your body and your limits. You don't let anyone push you too far, but you also challenge yourself. Okay, we've got um, Kenna, Kenna Mai here. Um, I'm not very confident, I'm not a very confident dancer. How can I improve? Um, there are also no dance classes in my town. What should I do? Um, this is a difficult one because if there's no classes, it's hard to have because a lot of the important thing about training and dancing is the community, it's the people around you. But actually, lockdown is a great time to be doing this because there are loads of fantastic classes oh, online. So, so much. much. And a lot of it will stay online after. You know what? You know what I'd say for everybody is that if you're a contemporary dancer or a ballet dancer and you're doing contemporary or ballet classes online, find a different class. Go and find some locking or hip hop or anything, because then you can you don't have to worry about going to a class and mm -hmm. looking like a fool. You can just go. I can do it in my room and go yeah. all wrong. So it's a great time to try new styles. I mean, you'd have no one watching you, so it doesn't matter how, I mean, even if someone was watching, it wouldn't matter, but still. And it's, you know, even I've been trying new styles in lockdown just so that I can experiment kind of in the privacy of our yeah. living room. Um, but also, you know, then, then once you've done that and you've got more confident alone, the thing is to start sharing with other people. So dancing with other people. So maybe that's setting up a, a group of people at school who like dancing that you want to connect with and you can just yeah. dance together. It doesn't have to be about performing even, it can just be about getting together and sharing dance. So um, breaking and hip hop is really good for this, there's a really strong community vibe. Yeah. So hip hop and breaking about people coming together to share ideas. So it's kind of getting over that first hurdle and finding people you trust, maybe other beginners or other people who are less confident. It can be so, hard with, with confidence because it's always going to be hard to go into a group of people and share your skills. Um, so wherever possible, I think just be comfortable in what you are doing. Um, if you can do a, a movement routine online, then if you if you know you can do that and build your confidence and your your comfort in that, then that should help as well. So if you're not very confident, the the harsh answer is try and work on your confidence, and that doing should more, yeah. should really help. The other thing I would say as well, which is something I some advice I was given, is buy the most, um, get the most. Uh, the best dance wear or active wear you can afford, which doesn't mean spending a lot of money, but something you feel really good in, because actually be able to look in the mirror and think, I feel like I look like a dancer, or I feel like a dancer, I've got my hair tied up like a dancer. Those sorts of little things, which kind of tricks, can help you sort of feel like you belong when you're feeling like you don't belong. So for me, it's really important. I mean, again, I don't spend much money on this, but I make sure that I'm sort of wearing what I feel makes me in the right zone to do the kind of act. So if I'm gonna do a hip hop class, I make sure I'm sort of wearing maybe looser clothes for a ballet class, I put my tights on, and that kind of helps me feel ready for the style that I want to work in, and a bit more like I belong. Okay, let's move, I hope that answers your question. Um, next question from Martina. Um, I think it's probably a similar, a similar answer, actually. Do you think that being a strong dancer is crucial for getting into college if you're strong at other disciplines is basically the question here. Um, it depends on the college. I mean, some colleges focus on movement, some colleges focus on singing, some people acting. It's about picking the place that's right to you. Obviously, you want to improve that movement skill so that you have more opportunities in your career and a more rounded understanding of the performing arts. But absolutely choose the college that's right for you. And to be honest, the college, you know, you'll get into the place where you belong. I auditioned for all dance schools. <laughs> I auditioned for... Uh, London Contemporary, Northern School of Contemporary Dance, Laban and Rombert. I only went to Rombert as a day out to what, see what it, was look, what it would look like because it was really lots of ballet and I hadn't done it. I only got into Rombert, I didn't get in anywhere else. I really wanted to go to Northern. So I got into the place that wanted me and I'm really grateful that I did go there. I struggled with it because my technique wasn't at that, at that level but they must have seen something in me that I didn't see in myself. So that was a boost of confidence as well. There's the other thing as well, as you're saying you're not a strong dancer, but I often find that people say that and they actually don't have any idea of their movement capacity. We actually like, don't like strong dancers. <laughs> Sometimes, yeah. We're, even Sometimes though we're dancers working with people, if you're a strong dancer, you try to dance the movement. And people who have been on our projects, you'll know this, that if you're trying to do a move, what's Rachel always say? Uh, if you can name it, you can't use it. Oh, yeah. If you give me a ronde de jambe or a, or a jeté, it's like, ah, 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 go away. We need something, we see you, your way of moving, not your way of dancing. So yeah. it all contributes to a whole performer, not just this idea of a triple threat. Yeah, I think the triple threat doesn't, I mean, I don't, I've never really met anyone who's equally good at all three disciplines. I can't sing at all, I at can. all. Um, but luckily <laughs> I don't actually work in that way. I don't perform musical theatre in that way. Okay, moving Let's on move to on. Edison. What's your favourite style? My favourite style of movement is pop action. Pop action is something developed by Elizabeth Streb in New York, which is essentially taking stunts and choreography and putting it together. It's cool. Go and check it out. Um, it, actually, we could have also shared a link with you. Yeah, so um, if you're interested, you can Google One Extraordinary Day, which was a piece that Kyle did in London where he, in 2012, where mm. he was harnessed 300 foot in the air in red yeah. lycra on the London Eye. I look like Spider-Man, it was amazing. Uh, it's quite a cool piece. Um, so that's, but that's yeah, that and lyrical jazz for me. What's your favourite style? Um, 
I really enjoy, well, contemporary dance is kind of my, where I've trained and what I really do, but I also really like working with actors because they have this kind of fresh perspective. So it's not really yeah. a style as such, but I find that actors, when they move, often have a really interesting way of moving. So that's probably my most enjoyable area to work in. Tips for improving your dance technique in lockdown. We've already kind of covered that. Yeah, There's shut tons up and online. Do it. There's tons online. Shut up and do it. Just dance. Um, and <laughs> also, this is a great time to also looking at fitness videos and that kind of thing. There's some really great links out there that are about staying stronger, not about changing your body or losing weight, any of those things. Ignore all of that. That's rubbish. I tell you what, also, for improving your tips with dancing in lockdown, is because it's online or on videos, you can pause it and you can go back. So you can actually focus on a specific thing. You can stop halfway through and really look at what that. So if they're saying to do a certain thing, you can stop it, look, and like, ah, okay, it's that and that. Am I doing that? So you can pause it. So take your time. There's no Russian lockdown. You've got. You've got we're all stuck we're, here. We're all inside. Take your time. And the other thing as well is there's loads of companies putting their work online, so you can watch musicals and plays and things. Yeah. And that means that you can also see how what companies are looking for and what kind of work is happening professionally. And that might help you think, okay, well, maybe I'll see if I can try that move or move yeah. like that. Gecko. Gecko is our favorite company at the minute. Gecko Theatre doing amazing work. Um, it's really interesting to see what, and then trying to work out what techniques they might be training in to get that kind so of. So anyone who's in a Dance Connection performance um, with us, go and check out Gecko. Because I think you'll, you'll like the kind of connection into what we do and what they do. So Gecko Theatre. Ella. Ella. Hello, Hello Ella. Ella. How, are we, how are you? <laughs> Ella. Hello. <laughs> your, your Ella was in our first ever Dance Connection piece in 2014. Whoop, whoop. Um, so starting our careers. Um... You must be so old now, Ella. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, I actually start? left the UK and went abroad, pretty much. I went to Germany and Belgium and places like that because for contemporary dance, that's where there's a lot of really interesting things happening. I traveled a lot um, and then through that, I built up connections and networks and also just my skills and experience. So I went from being a student to understanding what it was like to work as a dancer and work as a choreographer mm -hmm. and kind of broaden my life experience because I went into training at 18, as did Kyle. A lot of people don't. A lot of people in contemporary dance maybe go in in their mid-20s or even later and they have a bit more life experience and I hadn't had that and I felt like to be a good performer and a good dancer in contemporary dance I needed that so that's how I did it and then it's just a question of over time you build up networks connections yeah. you meet people obviously you go to auditions you might not get the job but you meet someone at the audition who remembers you Kyle literally had this Kyle auditioned for a job um but in Birmingham, a long time ago, and he didn't get the job because they were looking for oh, five too, men who were all the same. Tall. They wanted men. They wanted short men for it. Un, under six, six foot. foot. <laughs> and then a year later, he got a phone call from the same director saying, "We're now doing a different show, and we went want men over six foot." So that no, that, that that opportunity that went nowhere became something down the line. So yeah. meet people, go to class, attend shows, tell people you like their work, and you know, go up to someone in the bar after the show and say, "I think your piece is amazing." Yeah. And just make make friends because friends become people that you connect with and then you work with. Yeah, say yes and say it was good. Yeah, I think because you know, you... all of us are, you know, even people who are very experienced makers and artists still, it's nice to hear that people enjoy our work. If they're yeah. offering an open company class, you can attend We've that. given, the, the people we've employed for our shows is our friend now, so Lewis Parker Evans, who's currently with uh, Two Faced. Two Faced, he's one of their, their central performers. Um, he, we employed him on a project because he'd come to three of my workshops. So because he came to a workshop on floor work and partnering, I got to see him as a mover and saw who he was. We went, oh, we need uh, two more people. Ah, oh, that's it, Lewis. So yeah. just because we knew him, because he was in people's, he was in our minds. Yeah. That, that isn't to say that you should just keep going to everything. There's choose your choose your things, say yes, be generous with your time with yourself. And or importantly as well people. is that, you know, often when I'm looking to hire someone, it might be someone who I'm gonna be in a van with for six weeks touring. Or if it, you know what the BYMT shows like you've done them, you know, the people we work with on those BYMT shows, we're all living and working together. So I really want people that I enjoy working with. Obviously they have to be brilliant at their jobs, you know, incredible composers or dancers or whatever. But the main thing as well is also, is it gonna be enjoyable to work with them? for a period of time. So actually being nice to work with, being pleasant, being yeah. punctual, all those sorts of things, that really stands you in good stead. Yeah. Um, and we've got some questions about injury, which I think would be worth maybe kind of putting together. So something about spinal fusion surgery. Say more on uh, injury there. Okay, I'll just go with the spinal fusion thing first. We've asked, so I had spi spinal fusion surgery six months ago. Lots of metal work in my back. Have I come across this before? Um, I really want to do musical theatre, but flexibility is an aspect and really difficult for me. Um, yes, I've come across this before. I know quite a few dancers who have gone and had um, 
I'm going to call it major surgery. Uh, that, I don't hope that doesn't sound too scary, but yeah, it's you, spinal fusion. That sounds pretty, pretty big to me. Iron Man style. Um, if, if you've had that, then that is obviously going to have first of all a physical impact and it's going to have a mental impact. First of all, you think that you can't move in the same ways either as you used to or against somebody else. And because of that, you are going to think less of your ability to do something because you are not, because you're comparing yourself to somebody who hasn't had spinal fusion surgery, which is ridiculous because it, you are, you're each individual people. Um, back to the flexibility thing before, flexibility is not the, the thing that's going to give you a job. It's not going to be the thing that makes you, you, you are what makes you, you. Um, and just looking at your other skill set, working, to, if it was six months ago, you are the beginning, you are the beginning of this process. And you might not want to hear that, but I think dancers often or performers typically don't do their rehab. They don't do their rehab. They come back too soon and then they get injured again, or they don't progress because they, uh, this recovery time isn't there. So I don't know your specific case. I don't know your specific thing of spinal fusion, how big or small that was, but take your time. Go to your physio, go to your doctor, make sure you do the things, don't rush back. You're gonna to want to get back in things, but rehab, 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 make sure the body is there to support you. And hopefully that will then come back with your flexibility. You're obviously gonna be restricted if you've got metal work in your back, but I've got a dancer at the moment in the first year at Laban who, who has that. She's had a very similar, she had a, a scoliosis that had surgical intervention and she can't curve forwards very much, which really impacts her Cunningham training, which is all about curving the back. So we have to work with her and go, well, if we don't curve the spine, what else are we looking at? Where are the arm positions? Where's the head? Where's the body? She can yeah. rotate beautifully, but actually the curve is the thing that restricts her. So instead of focusing on the bit that is the problem, focus on everything else that is you available, do, yeah. which sound, but not having spinal fusion surgery, I don't really have a place to say that because I don't know what that feels like. But from students I've worked with, that has often been helpful. So focus on the things that you can and don't dwell on the things you can't change right now take your time to rehab properly the other thing i would say actually in that which is you can hear how much care you know kyle's given this particular student i have the same experience at gsa with the movement department there are students who have scoliosis and things and the staff talk about that they offer support they offer that extra guidance so make sure first of all you go somewhere you feel like that's what you're getting from the staff and confine them don't hide injuries i mean this is something a lot of dancers think that they hide they should hide an injury because people then people won't cast them or whatever. That's ridiculous. If we don't know what it is, we can't help you. So, yeah. if, you know, all that means is we go, okay, so this is a problem. So let's change this or adapt this or look at a work plan. So you have to talk to your teachers or, you know, and really get there. They have expert advice. So use that resource. Don't try and go it alone. For anyone who's dealing with injury or long-term kind of chronic problems, yeah. you have to use the resource of your school. That's what you're, you know, that's what you're paying for essentially is their expert opinion and advice and guidance and we all are used to adapting our classes for different needs and you know of all kinds so that's exactly that's what we do as uh, teachers in higher education we make sure that our work is suitable for the people we're teaching Gronia, um, in. hello Gronia. um advice for starting a course that is dance heavy if dance isn't your strongest area stand in the middle stand in the middle of a class don't stand at the front it'll be too <laughs> it'll be too scary if you stand at the back you don't get seen and it means that when you turn around to face the back there's no, one, there's to no one to follow. So stand in the middle of a class. Yeah. And as Rachel said before, dress for the event. So actually don't be shy. Don't feel nervous. Dress in, a, in what you're comfortable with and what you can move with. Tie your hair back, be present, engage with the teacher, say yeah. yes, um, answer their questions, say top tip, say hello and say thank you uh, in class. Hello. Uh, Hi, how, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for the class. Thank you very much. It yeah. means you get FaceTime. It's it means important you get to remember is that for a teacher, if you see someone who's standing at the back and not really paying attention, <laughs> you don't know if that's because they're shy or because they just don't care. So I'm going to give my time to the student who's at the front and working really, really hard. So be that student who's working hard and showing effort. And then I will give you all the extra time in the world you yeah. need to get where you need to go. Don't need to I'll be the appreciate best, that. but you need to be engaged. Yeah. So stand in the middle, engage with the teacher. Hypermobility. So we have a question about hypermobility joint syndrome and how can you dance that putting your joints at risk? Okay, there's a lot of... <laughs> you, That's a question person. for Kyle. That's science, science person. Science. But I can answer this, but I think this is where you can be more of an expert. So there's, there's going to be the science of this, there's going to be the training of this, and there's going to be the culture of this. So the culture... Sorry, I'm just fiddling around with this. Stop, stop fiddling. <laughs> so the culture of this is that 
most dancers and most people dancing want this element of hypermobility. They all want to look like they've got sway back legs and really super flexible, the legs can kick everywhere. But the truth is that then people are the ones that seem to get injured the most. This idea, oh, where's my question gone? Uh, they're putting joints at risk. But because of that, there's also a fear around, I'm going to put my joints at risk. So all those people who have hypermobile elbows and arms where their arms bend slightly further back than the average person, it means that if I'm doing a press up, my arm tends to look more wavy and people think that's going to lock into the joint and be dangerous. And like, yes, in some way, if you're going to lock into that without the control, yes, it could be. But the truth is you need to look at stabilizing that joint. You have uh, a gift in some sense, in some ways that you have easier flexibility, but, but hard work ahead of you because you have to control that flexibility and stabilize it. So it's nothing to be, to be worried about. It's something to be conscious of and be proactive about. So think about wherever it is that you're hypermobile, if you're globally hypermobile, like your short, like I'm quite loose in my shoulders and my elbows, um, Rachel, I've hypermobile feet. Feet and legs, so, knees and ankles. So we're not globally, my, my feet and legs aren't the same as Rachel's. Um, so I have to think about the stability of my shoulders. So how do I make sure my, I can rotate my shoulder and lift it and move it and make sure they're strong? And again, actually, the key point is it's training in a place where you feel like you're, those foundations are being set well. You're not being pushed into things. You're not being pushed to be more flexible. But you're actually training correctly and safely. That You're taking the time to warm up and cool down to do your supplementary training. So if you've been given physio, do that work, basically. A lot of dancers say, I'm getting injured or I'm getting hurt. But actually, they haven't done their physio. They haven't done their warm up. Uh, they don't. You know, yeah. uh, warm up. Yeah. If you're having mobile, do the work. go. Oh, damn, you've got, to, you've got to warm up properly. Don't just kind of rely on the teacher to come in and, and do a quick warm up. If you know you have certain things that need stabilizing and warming up, you have to find what works for you. You get into the studio early and you do those activities. Yeah, if you're, if you're rocking up with two minutes before the class starts, you're not ready and you could be putting yourself at, at risk. Uh, friends of ours will go to the studio like an hour before if they're in like a professional company and do their warm up. I'm not suggesting that. But kind of if you get to the studio 15 minutes early, it means you have the, the time to, to talk with your friends and also do the things that you need to do before the class starts. So be proactive in your approach and yeah, don't, don't be nervous about it. Proactive working, I think. Okay, we've got a few more questions about flexibility and strength. There's just two here I think we should answer. I think we should move on from flexibility. I think we've talked about it quite a lot. And some of these yeah. questions were probably asked before we got like so, a while back. So, we've got so flexibility, what's more important, flexibility or strength? I think we've answered that. Both. Both. If you're flexible, strength train. If you're strong, get some get some flexibility. Yeah, you they need have, both. They have to work together. Otherwise, you are it, you're selling yourself short. Yeah, so and also you're more likely to get injured. Don't forget, you know, dancers. You've got to, got to think long term here. You may be thinking about wanting to be able to do a certain move now, but you want to be dancing, you know, for another thirty years, uh, forty years potentially, and then you need to really think about your body long term. For forty years, you planning for yourself there yeah so, well i'm getting we're getting old um, okay so this is a question about stretches for box splits and over splits i think that's quite a specific question I, we sort of touched on what we feel think about flexibility so i suggest we move on from that question Hang on, i'm going to pause a second if, let me just read this because over splits is a massive thing let me just read this so i can do splits on both legs but i'm struggling to get further than that what stretches would you recommend to improve my box splits and over splits how much should I be stretching? Are there any exercises you would recommend for strength too? So I won't go into that. I'm just gonna go on box splits and over splits. Because you're in a world of Instagram and YouTube and social media, you are constantly seeing, whether you are kind of actively looking for it or not, people who are more flexible, more strong, who are generally better than you or what you think you are. Over splits is gonna be one of the most, it's gonna be the, one of the biggest contributors to dancers injury at the moment because I keep seeing dancers who can't yet do splits, who are training for over splits. If you're sat there on the floor and your leg <clears throat> is up on a load of blocks, you need to stop that. The problem, the problem with this is that if this is my leg and this is my knee in the middle, you're pushing the knee down. So the problem is that you're putting an overstretch into the hamstring and you're putting pressure into the knee. Now, if you're hypermobile and you're trying to do over splits and you're not strong in your knees, ankles and hips, you're gonna get injured. Yeah, because you're not controlling this. So we're not saying that you can't do these moves. That's a really important thing. We, we don't know your body. We don't know how you've trained. All those things. So we're not saying categorically these are bad moves. Yeah, just think but we're about... just saying handle with caution. I think also think about why you want over splits. And if it's because it's on Instagram, that doesn't really relate to what a professional right. dance career looks like. I mean, you don't really ever do over splits on stage. So a good, a good friend of mine is a handstand artist and he does handstands and does splits in handstands. So he has gravity to help his legs come down. So he wants an element to over split, but he trains that consciously and carefully. 
people keep putting the front leg on blocks. Why don't we put the back knee on blocks? So we take the pressure out of the knee. Either way, just think about your, instead of just doing splits and then trying to do over splits, make sure you can do a completely flat split and then you can you can move your body freely. That's going to be way better what, than over split. What I think is really important as well is, yeah, like what is this for? Because if it's a particular move you want to master, fine. But like I said, I've never put, like I've never seen an over split done on stage. I've never seen anyone use the kinds of moves in actually in performance, maybe on like um, talent competitions, but that's not what a professional dance show looks like. Audition, audition where somebody looks at you and just slides into Yeah, splits. you know, those kinds of things, which are great, <laughs> but that's not what it looks like again, long term as a career. So yeah. really think about why you want to master these moves, any move. Okay. And um, favorite dance companies, this is great. So we've mentioned a few. Mm. I really like physical theater companies. So I like Frantic Assembly, Gecko Theater and Complicite. They're my top three dance companies. Another great company is Peeping Tom in Brussels. These are all ta uh, dance theatre companies yeah. who do physical theatre and dance theatre. So they tell stories, they might use acting, they might use song, it kind of, they create a whole world. So it's not just about dance routines, they're creating an entire like um, world. world on stage. Yeah. And it's like a whole story you go through. So for me, that's what's exciting. Yeah, the same, same companies for me were both in a very similar, we both like that storytelling narrative. Um, Ultima Vez is another company that's uh, that's European. They are not um, not quite as narrative as Peeping Tom or Gecko, but they've yeah. got some interesting ways of moving. So, um, just in case you're not familiar with the UK dance scene as well, Hoffa Schechter Company is always quite a good company to look at because of their physicality. Um, uh, Crystal Pite, who's done a lot of work on the Royal Ballet Company. Crystal Pite, yes. A really interesting choreographer. Um, also, yes. Yasmin Vardaman. So these are kind of companies that, um, again, still work in this kind of dance theatre way. So, um, in fact, Crystal Pite's piece, Betroffenheit, is currently on, you can find it online to watch. Yeah, um, yeah Yasmin Vardaman Company. And I'm trying to think, there's just a few companies like that. So once you start to find one or two, you start to find more that you like. Other thing is because we're in lockdown, Cirque du Soleil have all their, not maybe not all, but a lot of their shows online. And for me, for us making work, Cirque du Soleil have this massive budget, massive world. But if we can make that within dance, within theatre, then this, this creation of world on stage is, is I think, mm. what really interests us. So using movement as a vocabulary, not just thinking it's a dance. So dance as a tool to tell a story and then making a, a set and a world that is yeah. good, like having, what, a thousand cans on, a, on stage? Yes, so for those of you who were in Extinction, Extinction this last year, we had a thousand tin cans. The year we have for Swan Lake, we had five kilos of feathers. Feathers. For Sweat Factory, <laughs> we had a lot of money's worth of rags. Lo loads of rags to throw um, around. So we tend to use bit one big thing. Oh, and, for and Dark Tower, it. there was thousands of plastic bottles. We like using Bottles. an element and really creating a really interesting set. Yeah. Um, so for those of you in those shows, you probably remember those things. So there are companies. Um, and then from there, just look at all companies that are, are similar-ish. I think we both like, yeah, dance theater, things, yeah. people that make worlds and not just doing dance for dancing sake. Like yeah. the, the dancers on Wayne McGregor's company are beautiful. Like if you like really technical dance, then go look at Wayne McGregor's company, but it doesn't really interest us as much, no, does it? No, well, it, yeah, just in terms of the actual pieces, so. Yeah. Um, this is interesting. So Flo's asked about a good way. Oh, hello, Flo. Hello, Flo. I'm who you are. <laughs> a good way to improve your, insp your, not inspiration skills, your improvisation skills. Mm. Well, come on a BYMT project. But actually, seriously, a lot of BYMT <laughs> projects use these sorts of techniques, especially if you come and work with us. Yeah. Um, I think the, the thing about being, in, uh, being a good improviser is it's about being really present in the moment, which means not thinking about, not planning, not trying to be clever or funny or smart or any of these things, but actually just paying attention to what's happening now and saying yes. So that means obviously practicing improvisation, whether it's acting or dance, um, but also it means getting good at paying attention to what's going on around you. So you're not in your own bubble. So for me, actually, it's actually things as well, like drawing and journaling and going for a walk and noticing what's around me. So sharpening my observation and sharpening my awareness, that really helps me be present when I'm improvising. So I really notice what needs to happen rather than what I think might be a good idea. Because we all know that thing where we've had a really good idea to, with improvisation and we try it and it doesn't quite work. And it's because you're not in now, you're thinking about what's going to happen and then you're not really noticing what needs to happen. So getting, um, having techniques in your life to get good at paying attention to now, um, letting go of your ego a little bit so you're not thinking about looking good. You can't look good when you improvise. I mean, all kinds of weird things happen. That's what makes it really brilliant. And, um, you know, you have to do the odd things and the strange things to find the good stuff. So kind of not worrying about how, how you look almost is an important that's, thing. That's for improvisation. My, mine is commitment. So if you're in an improvisation, commit to that improvisation. This is something that I personally struggle with. 
when working with Rachel, Rachel uses uh, voice a lot in her improvisations. And often we've done things where we will breathe or we'll talk or we'll shout. And that takes me a long time to get comfortable with. Every time we try, every time we do it, it's, I always find it really difficult. And I have to tell myself, I have to commit to it and go, just don't, don't worry about how it feels, don't worry about how it looks, just do it and try it. And what we do with improvisations in our creative work is we will film them. So if we're, if we're working on, on an idea, put a camera in the corner and we'll then move and we'll do this. And I have to remember that I have to do it the best that I can at the time, no matter how, how much I struggle with it or how kind of silly I feel in order to look back at it and get a good, a good movement quality, a good idea afterwards. So it's not about the moment, it, well, it is about the moment right there committing, but it's about after that and what your choreographer, your maker, your director is looking for. Mm. So committing to the task is a, is a really, for me, it's a hard skill to develop, but it's a, it's a vital skill for our creative work. So there's two questions now, which I think are kind of linked. One is about whether we'd recommend going to dance school at 16 or 18, and another from Poppy, who we know. Hello, Poppy. Hey, Poppy. Um, to talk about going to university to study dance, sorry, study history, and whether it's too late to then sort of go back and train in MT or whatever later. So I think this one is really difficult questions because it slightly depends on the industry. So contemporary dance is what we both train and what we kind of, the, the perspective, even though we work in musicals and opera and theater and things like that, we come at it from the perspective of being contemporary dance professionals first and it's kind of evolved um so for contemporary dance i said you know actually possibly not the later the better but actually a slightly more mature student will be able to have the intelligence and the sort of intellectual capacity and the work life experience to maybe do better because it's about your creativity and those things and those things just evolve as you get older i'm not saying you don't have those things when you're 16 or 18 but the older you get the more life experience you have um, for mt and stuff it's a bit more difficult because often you might have certain sort of physical requirements that do i mean if we're being very honest you know the older we get the harder it is to do certain things so if you think about your long career you might want to start earlier however i will say that ne it's never too late and i really really think this it's never 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 too late um one of my very closest friends that i trained with um he he, he came on a whim to london contemporary dance school audition when he was 25 he was a bank manager he joined a friend he got in he did three years there he, he's worked all over the world with neoclassical, I mean, neoclassical companies, so really high level technical ballet. Mm -hmm. He's worked in Canada, he's worked in America. He's, had, I mean, he's now nearly 40 and he's had an entire career, um, you know, based on um, starting very, very late in very highly technical work. So it's never too late. I also just think as well, it, there's, you only have one chance to do things like school. You know, you don't get to go back and be a sixth former. So when people want to leave that because they're worried about their dance career, I sort of, if it's because it's what you really, really want and you don't want to be at school and you want to go to train, fab, do that. But if you think, oh, it might be too late, it's not too late. No. 16, 18, 21, 25. We've even had first years who are 30 at places like Lab and, and they thrive. Um, so please don't panic. Time is not running out for you. Um, Particularly if, if you're... So if you're thinking, do I go to 16 or 18, which might mean that you're 15 now, which means you're... I guess doing GCSEs and exams. Yeah, and you're trying or to not a, doing GCSEs and exams not, at the moment. If you're, if you're trying to make a big life decision of should I start dancing now while also being stressed on exams, do your exams, just do your exams, I mean, get that done. I other, did, other people will say other things, but I think- we, I did you know, French, maths, English for A-level um, <laughs> till I was 18. And then I went to train and it didn't affect, in fact, if anything, what was interesting is as a woman, our, with our sort of peak physicality is 25 to 30. So what I actually found was that when I was 18 and I was training, I actually physically wasn't ready. I couldn't, I was hard to get strong. It was hard to do things. My body wasn't quite ready. And then I hit 25 and it was like a lot of things came together. So the first few years of my career, 21 to 25, I was actually struggling with fit because my body wasn't kind of physically developed as I wanted it to be to do the things I wanted it to do. So it's very bespoke. Um, but I would say, you know, if you, if you want to go to university, Poppy, and that's what you really want to do, do it. It's never too late. In fact, two, two of my very good friends did degrees at Cambridge um, English degrees at Cambridge and then joined London Contemporary Dance School. Um, Amy is currently the, like the um, a director of um, artist development at the place, having had a long yeah. career as a dancer. Katie is a very successful choreographer in the world. They both have very fulfilling careers and their degree in English before that really, really helped them. I hope that answers your question. Um, okay, so... Uh, uh, right, so we've got a few people we know. Hello, Holly. Hello, Megan. Oh, but I just want to scan yes, down, so we've only got 20 minutes left. I want to just see what questions are and if we can group any. So we've got a question on improving in hip-hop, questions on injuries and rejection, 
physical theatre. Flo, we've already answered one of your questions, so we might not answer your second one. <laughs> Same for Holly. I can see you've asked, asked two. Um, I like the commitment, though. Straight in. It's major setback. That's a great question. Okay, so what? Oh my God! <laughs> right. Loads of people. We're going to try and go a little. Bit, people in. We're going to try well and go done. a little bit quicker. I thought we were going um, quick. But we've still got twenty minutes left. But also, I will say, if there are any questions that you, we don't answer, um, tweet BYMT, copy me in. It's at our Birch Lawson. So just tag me on it, or just tweet BYMT. That's fine, and we will try and answer them on social media that way. Okay. Yeah. So. Um, well, Stella's asked about tips for improving in hip hop. Dance, uh, I train in jazz, ballet, tap, contemporary. I want to broaden my dance styles. Um, okay, so I'm, I started in hip hop. Maybe you can do it because you you didn't start in hip hop. No, um, I think as, to be honest, you know, take take classes. That's it. I mean, the only the only way to get better at something is to do the work. And again, you can do the work at home. Yeah, it's, um, a, it's a great time right now to actually get a foundation. I get a foundation this work because yeah. if if me and Rachel went to a hip hop class, I started in hip hop and break dance. So I started in ballet. Started in ballet and flamenco. And yes, yeah, so it's really difficult. So I think it's about um, it's, a also, it's, a it's also thing. being really good at letting go of what you know. So sometimes I think people go in and they go, but I've done all this training in ballet and I really want to use it. And actually, if the teacher's asking something different of you, embrace that. Go if for you're it. in a hip hop class trying to do a ponche, you're in the wrong place. Yeah. Like you've got, you've got to kind of let that go. My tips for doing hip hop, again, is like improvisation is commit to it. It is going to feel strange because you're suddenly, instead of kind of moving through space, you might be moving like da, 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 moving short and quick, and then it doesn't feel as good or feel the same. So go through it slowly, uh, just engage with the process. And the first few classes are gonna feel terrible. They're gonna feel like yeah. you're not very good at all. So again, stand in the middle of the class. Be the beginner again. Let people, be, yeah, don't, yeah. Yes. Okay. Don't be afraid to be the beginner again. So just kind of commit to it and have a, have a go. So question on dealing with injuries and a question on dealing with rejection. Um, do you want to cover injuries first? Injuries, what's the quick way? Well, there, um, is, there is no, okay. So there is no quick way. You can't, you what's, can't. What's the quick way for healing injuries? injuries. The quick Holly, way. you know what we're going to say to this. God damn it, Holly. The, the quick way is the, is the right way. And, and probably the slow way. The, the long way around dealing with an injury. So let's just, here's the scenario. You injure yourself. You go and see, you don't see a physio, you don't see anybody, you just go, it's okay, I'll dance it off. It feels better and you constantly have an injury forever. That's one scenario. Yeah. Scenario two is that you injure yourself, you stop, you go and see a physio, the physio says, you've done this, this and this, take two weeks out and do this rehab. You might take one week out and do some of the rehab. You've seen somebody get diagnosed, um, you have an idea what it is, but you haven't done the full thing. Third scenario is the right scenario that you you get an injury, you go and see a physio, they say take two weeks out and do this rehab for six months and, and you, you do, do it. it. Yeah. And then what you do is you do it longer. The trick with rehab, in my opinion, I've been lucky that I haven't had any major injuries, but I've had small injuries that I've had to rehab. That's a lie, ruptured ligaments in yeah. my ankles, why have? And I went wrong the first time and right the second time. So the first time I didn't take the time off, didn't do the rehab. I went back to class, I did the ankle strain again. So then I took the time off, I did the rehab and I continued doing the rehab and I integrated it into my work. By doing that, I now don't really remember which ankle I injured. Yeah. Um, so- <laughs> There's a car horn outside, car I hope horn. you can't hear. Um, so there isn't a quick way, there is the right way. I will say as well, like sometimes people feel like um, they haven't got time to take the time off. Now, I understand when you're a professional and it's your livelihood or you're in training, it's your third year at a conservatoire, then maybe it does feel like you can't take time off. Even then I'd say that's not the right approach. When you're, when you're still at school and you're pre-training, you can take the time off. You know, there's no show, there's no exam, that's more, there's nothing that's more important than your long-term health and well-being. Because if you have an injury now that you don't look after now, you could have that for the rest of your career. So for the next 20, 30, 40 years, you could be carrying this problem that keeps happening. This book is going to look mirrored to you here, but just so you can see the cover. This book is uh, The Complete Guide to Exercise Therapy by a guy called Christopher M. Norris. This book is a, a book that I go to constantly, both for my work as a, as a teacher, as a coach, but the beginning of it, it talks about what injury is and what you need to be, can, what you need to think about. It also then gives you strategies to get out of the injury as well. Yeah. So this, A Complete Guide to Exercise Therapy, I think is a really good tool to, to inform you. Okay, so check that out in case that's useful. 
Okay, so Megan, hello Megan. Um, any tips on dealing with rejection? This is really hard. And if you, that's Megan's nickname that Kyle just called out, if you don't Sorry, know what I just said. Um, if, the thing is, is that this is part of the reality of working in the performing arts, dealing with rejection, and it's, it's very, very hard. I mean, it's the same in any career, many people apply for jobs, but we have such transient careers, we change jobs a lot, we um, often have a lot of people going for the same job, so it is really, really difficult, and there isn't a really an easy answer, everyone has to handle it differently. Um, I do think it's really important to remember that the people who are judging you, whether that's an audition panel or casting agent, have different opinions. There are people that I've seen and gone, wow, I, I think they're amazing. Like I would, that's a 10 out of 10 for me. And someone next to me has gone, oh no, I'm not too fast. You know, they're, they're obviously good, but I mean, there, there was a performer that we've worked with at, at, at BYMT who Kyle really saw potential. I thought she was very good, but Kyle was really excited by this particular mm. person. And I couldn't see, I mean, I could see that she was good, but I couldn't see why he was quite so excited. And then a couple of years down the line, I saw her again and went, oh, I saw, I see what Kyle saw. I'd missed that. I'd missed how good she was going to be. Yeah. So I think it's important to remember that it's only people's opinions people's opinions, different people's tastes, different. I mean, if you're going, like, I am not really a commercial MT choral for director, so I don't look for things like flexibility. I look for things like commitment, authenticity, and power. Mm -hmm. um, I'm much more interested in someone can dive role than if they can do an arabesque. Yeah. And no one ever does an arabesque in my piece, but people do do dive roles. So what my criteria will be different <laughs> from Kyle's criteria <laughs> and from someone else's criteria. So first of all, remembering that. And second of all, um, I heard a really good thing once, which is try and collect no's from an actor, actor, she said, try and collect no's, you know, aim to get a hundred no's, because if you get, if you keep just collecting no's, then every no is one, you know, it's one more in your collection. It's not a bad thing. It's actually great. I've got another no to add to my collection. And yeah. that takes me closer to a yes. And that for me is about tolerance. So rejection tolerance. Okay. It's like if, um, like say you're doing a, a plank and you're trying to outplank somebody else and you can do one minute and they can do five minutes. They can do five minutes because they practice doing one minute, two minute, three minute, four minute. So a tolerance for rejection, it doesn't mean that you are a terrible person, and you'll never do what you want to do. It means that right now, that one person, that school, that company, that show doesn't want you right now. Doesn't mean they won't want you ever. It just, but that's still, it's, it's hard to hear that. So we do have to take into consideration the mental health side of that, and make sure you have good strategies that help you cope with this. Yeah. So if you have a good coping strategy that maybe after that you then, you make sure you talk to friends, you make sure you go, hey, uh, this happened, I feel really bad about this. Uh, can you help me out and just talk it out might be one thing. Mm -hmm. Other things might be, again, collecting the no's. So if you can always, the thing that I always do is always ask for feedback. So if I didn't get something, great, thank you for that. Um, can you can you tell me why? I mean, I literally actually had this. I applied for a job recently that I was like, I looked at the application. I thought, literally, this is perfect. This is everything I do. And I applied and I thought I might not get the job, but I'll definitely get an interview. And I didn't get invited to interview. And I was really surprised. I, mean, I was disappointed. But I was also very surprised. So I contacted and said, can I just ask why I really thought like I hit all the criteria? I said, basically, we had three people apply who'd literally done this exact job somewhere else. And you were the fourth on the list. Yeah. So you know, another time, another day, I'd have been number. So, so what that does is it three. helps situate you in in your in your frustration. So it might it's not just like a, a yes or a no. It's if if it was no, but how how far were you? Yeah. And like, why? I mean, it could just be that like it could be that they wanted the people the under six foot two, like that. Yeah. Carl in that job, you know. And <laughs> I, 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 mean, I definitely wouldn't get that. I job. went all the way to Paris for a thirty minute audition. I got cut in the first round. You did, you did like a plie and then got cut. I'm in, I'm in, I'm in Paris now for three days. What, now what do I do? You didn't use that book to stay for the whole run of the audition. But look, the thing God. is as well is that it is hard. And if you need to go and have a cry and feel rubbish for a bit, do that. Totally. And then pick yourself up and work out what you want to do with yeah. this rejection. Okay. okay. Um, I hope that helps. Um, so physical theatre companies, we've mentioned, so if someone's asked about what companies there might be for inspiration physical theatre, we've mentioned a few earlier, so I hope that answers your question. Gecko, Complicite, Frantic Assembly, Peeping, Peeping Tom, Tom, Ultima Bears, Ultima Bears Crystal Pipe, um, yeah. when she works not with the Royal Ballet, but with other companies. Ooh, um, okay, so Flo, well no, because when she works with other companies, not physical theatre. <laughs> oh yeah, that's Flo, what you mean. we already answered a question of yours, so if you want to yeah. ask this question again, um, put it onto social media, just put it at BYMT. That's What's the best way to be noticed in auditions? Um, We've answered a question from you, Holly. So same thing again. We're going to ask you to put that onto social media at BYMT if you want that answered. It, it's, a, it's the same way as coping in class. Actually, be present, engage. Uh, if they ask a question, answer the question, say hello at the beginning, say thank you at the end. And remember, they're looking for a specific thing. It might not be you this time. 
and you can't change that. And in fact, you know, don't try and be something you're not. Yeah. Um, and if that's not you, I mean, don't forget you're also auditioning them. You know, maybe oh, it's not yeah. right fit. You know, this, maybe this is the thing that saved me. <laughs> this has saved me so many times that when I realized this, I was like, ah, yeah. So yes, I'm going for an audition. Yes, I want you to give me a place in whatever I'm auditioning for. But at the same time, I don't know you. Do I want to work with you? So if you think there's a true story, James Cousins story, I auditioned for James Cousins company once. I was like, brilliant, I'll go, I'll go and do that. I walked out of the audition, not in a horrible way, but because in the first 10 minutes, I realized that I couldn't do that job. It, the, the, cat, the movement was so fast. It was like, I wanted to go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, one, five, five. and I was like, whoa, that is not me. Like, even if you want me, even if you give me the job, I don't think I can do the job. So I'm auditioning you at the same time. Now that I'm in a privileged situation where I could do that. So if I don't need that job right now, or I'm, because I'm older, like I've, I've done the auditions, I've done the training. So it's slightly different, but at the same time, there is some power with you as, as the performer and the person auditioning. If you don't like the people actually then, and you don't need that job, Okay, then let's, let's I'm, I'm, I'm interviewing so you're you. you're not always the sort of, um, you're not, not victim, powerless. Yeah, you're not powerless. You do have a say in the way things go for you. Um, okay, so have you ever had any major setbacks in your career that you've had to bounce back from from Oliver? I guess all the time. Loads. Like all the time. I mean, Our career I, is made up of setbacks. Yeah, and I mean, what's really odd is some things um, that you think are a disaster turn out to be the best thing ever. So I, a long time ago, about 11 years ago, um, got down to the final cut for a particular company that I really wanted to work for. And it was like, this would have really opened a particular strand of my career um, in terms of being a touring dancer in a particular way. And it was a company that I would have like killed to dance for. And I was in the final two and I was the one that didn't get the job. And I was devastated for about a month, like really devastated. I really couldn't, you know, it took a long time to recover from it. Because I didn't have anything to do, we started making a duet in the studio just for fun. And that launched an entire choreographic career with Kyle that 10 years later is probably the main thing I do. So that disaster oddly became, you know, one of the best things that ever happened to me. And actually I heard the person who got the job didn't particularly enjoy it. They weren't very nice to work for. So, you know, odd silver lining. Right now, I mean, um, originally we would have been touring a piece right now because we got offered more teaching work at GSA in Larvin, we decided to put our tour on hold. If we'd been touring right now, it would all have been canceled because of um, lockdown and all of that work would have gone gone out the window. So what felt you know, 18 months ago and we had to decide to yeah. cancel our touring plans, like a disaster and quite sad, but also something we were very pleased about because we were really looking forward to the teaching work we were going to be doing. Yeah. Again, long way around. So I think, so first of all, it's in realizing that what might seem like a setback now might actually be something good later. Second of all, it's, um, it, setbacks can be a really good opportunity to take stock of what you do and don't want. So I have a foot injury that is a chronic foot injury and it helped me understand that actually dancing wasn't my primary interest. It was choreography because I couldn't dance for a bit. So I focused on choreography and I realized that was what my passion was. So it allowed me to refocus and work out where my priorities were. And then finally as well, it is just that mental health, you know, it's, it's talking to people, talking to friends, yeah. Um, being open. I, mean, I think sometimes we feel like it's a bit shameful to admit that we don't know how to do something or we didn't get another audition. I remember years ago when we first met, I remember once there was an audition we both applied for and I didn't get called for it and Kyle didn't. I never told you that I didn't get called for it because I was embarrassed by that. Seriously. And actually it's really important I think to just realize that we all have that. There'll be, that's happened to you. you know, all of us have had those setbacks and that's part and parcel of being an adult, a performing artist, working in this really crazy, yeah. weird world. So sharing and not being shy to say, I don't know how to do that. How do you get an agent? Um, how have you got oh, that job? Yeah. I mean, sometimes I look at colleagues, I'm going, how have they got that job? And actually it turns out it's because they knew somebody and they probably look at me yeah. and think, how have you got that job? It's just, it's about understanding that things look very different from the outside. The other thing that I think affects both of us as well, from a setback point of view, doesn't need to be a setback that somebody said no. A setback can be that like for us, it's burnout. We tend to work really, we, really hard. We, we go from nothing to everything. And we tend to have a work career that goes up and down as opposed to having like a kind of it's, it's all yeah. the time. We invest everything. And then we, then when the job stops, we stop and we crash. But sometimes we invest too much. And sometimes we have to have this downtime and it's called burnout. And it's when you have, you have lose your motivation. You are frustrated and confused and sad. Um, and just you, you don't know what to do to get out of the funk that you're in. It's like, oh, I just, I just feel a bit strange. And the more you go through that, or the quicker you can recognize it and go, this is just a process of recovery, 
-hmm. It's not just about going, I did this job, then next job, and next job, and next job, and next job. It's like sometimes we need to have that pause just to go, whew, okay, let's reevaluate, let's see what we're doing next, and then let's progress. So making sure you actually have time to recover either from each project or I mean all of you done BYMT know that you do it and you don't really sleep for two weeks and it's it's amazing and it's exhausting and then you finish and I don't know you know like we always sleep for about a week to recover I now know after doing it for how many years for 13 years that I need to schedule a week to recover I used to try and go to the next I always have BYMT dreams I always like wake up the next week thinking I'm like in the in the rehearsal room I'm like oh (laughs) Oh, I'm late. Yeah, like, and it's yeah. like for about a week because yeah. my brain is so clicked in to that project. It takes me a week to kind of come out of that. So physical recover, men- recovery, yeah. mental, mental recovery, I can't even speak. Okay, so We've got about five minutes this is left. a great question from Kate, um, Katie about how do you choose a training path if you want to go into more than one area? So Katie's mm. interested in being a performer, a choreographer and a stage manager. How many, how do you get oh. to be versatile? I think a lot of um, the more contemporary courses will train you as a performer and choreographer equally. So BAs at places like London Contemporary Dance School, Laban. Um, Opportunities those, to make as well. You'll be, you'll be both choreographing and performing. But actually, even in places like um, GSA, there's a choreography competition. There's so, obviously, lo- there's, there's lots of kind of internal courses in the course. So I know that Laban has their, like their performance strands. And then you can also make work as part of um, some of the modules that are there. They have yeah. a choreography module, but then that can go on to making work later on. So they also have, <laughs> time's running out, time's running out. <laughs> they also have, in one of their projects, there is a strand that you can choose set design, stage management and lighting design. So a lot of the courses now do have this integrated, but I think to be able to do each one as a career, you learn as you progress. Yeah. So for example, you might train as a performer for three years and then start making work for fun. And then through that, you learn how to choreograph through also working with great choreographers. You then might find that you actually want to get a job working backstage at the theater, just helping out. And then that helps you broaden your stage management skill set. So it's about work experience, not just training. Yeah. And it's about not trying to cram it all into three years. Sometimes you don't have to choose. Sometimes you've just got to include. Yeah. So I think what, what I'm trying to say is it's about not trying to find a course that covers all those things, but about making sure that you know, you can focus on one or two now, add the other one later, look for work experience opportunities in other ways. Um, best time of day for stretching. There isn't one. one. No, there we, isn't we've one. done lots of stretching questions. There isn't the best time. Do you have to study dance at uni to become a choreographer? No, not at all. No. Also, I would say make sure if you're training in dance that there are a lot of university dance courses and then there's conservatoire training. And the level of training offered is different and often the um, requirements for entry are different. So if you go to a university, you might not be actually training at the level. You may be, you may not be, you need to be a professional performer. So you need to look at a full-time vocational training if that's what you're interested in as a performer. For choreography, it's much more broad because you want life experience. But make sure that, you know, you look at how many hours of technique you're doing and that kind of thing on your course, because not all courses offer the same. So for example, the place we did about eight to 10 hours of physical training a day, whereas some universities might do eight to 10 hours a week. Yeah um how okay let's look at this how do you maintain such a positive mindset i think we've answered that one we've talked about resilience and bouncing back and we've got two minutes shoulder muscles are constantly pulled consistently pulled um i wonder if that's something you could answer more specifically on social media yeah i would check in with the physio if you've got if your shoulder muscles are are constantly pulled and so, uh, and so is my neck when I dance. There's either going to be a movement pattern that you're doing or something that might be uh, chronically tight or out of place. So I would go and see a, either a sports or a dance specific physiotherapist. Sometimes just a, a normal physio might not understand the nature of what it is that you're doing as a performer. So if you can look, so One Dance UK, uh, an institution that they, you can look them up online. They have a practitioner list. So you can actually find a physiotherapist close to you who knows how to work with dancers or performers that'll be a good place to go. And the same for everybody. If you've got something a bit dodgy with your body, find a dancer or a performance specific physiotherapist or osteopath or trainer. Okay. Yeah. Um, if you, oh, what style of dance do you reckon focusing on first as a beginner during lockdown? Whatever you want to do. There's whatever no, there's no credit. Whatever sounds fun. Whatever teacher looks good. Do whatever you enjoy, especially the thing, now. The thing you don't know. Yeah. Um, if you get injured during audition, what should you do? Go and talk to the audition panel. Absolutely. Don't soldier on. Yeah. If you get injured, you know, the first thing you do in any situation is go and tell the person running the session that this has happened. Now, obviously, they may not, they may, they may only be able to say, okay, just sit out, but they may be able to say, great, let's get you some support. And also, they'll be more, um, hopefully, more skilled than you in diagnosing exactly might, what might have gone wrong in terms of how serious it is. Yeah. So talk to them. 
Online classes for Graham Technique. I'm not aware of any online classes for Graham Technique at the moment. If I find mm. any, I'll tweet them to BYMT. I'm yeah. sorry. Um, we're, at, we're, in, we're at one o'clock. What I suggest we do, Tatiana from the office, give us a shout if this is okay. Can we do another five minutes to answer a few more questions? Is that okay? Give me a thumbs up, Tatiana, if that's possible. Um, and then the rest will have to answer through Twitter. She might answer it at the bottom. Uh, yes, you certainly can. Okay, oh. yay. Thank you, Tatiana. <laughs> but we are going to try and power through. We talk too much. Where were okay. we um, Great. Okay, so flexibility. We've talked a lot about flexibility. I'm going to skip past that on Martina. But sorry. Um, Hyperextended legs, lock back naturally. Talked about that's hyperextended. Talked about sorry. Tendonitis in the feet for point. I think we've talked about injury in those. Ten, sort of uh, hang on a second. Do you have any tips for tendonitis? If you get tendonitis, tendonitis, tendon, tendon, whatever, it's usually because of an inflammation in that tissue, and it means you need to rest. Now, this might not be. I'm not a physiotherapist. I don't. I can't see your body. I can't see your feet, so I don't know you specifically. But typically, when people have tendonitis or tendonosis, that they have to then have. Uh, at, at downtime, so you might be overworking that joint. Anything that's inflamed has to then rest to recover. That's not what a dancer ever wants to hear, that you have to stop, but that's why they keep getting the injury. And again, it's you want to think about whether you want to dance for the next few weeks, next few months, or for the rest of your life. Here's the thing, two, two days off is better than two weeks. Two weeks off is better than two months. Two months out is better than not having a career in dance. Yeah, that's that's um, I'm just gonna jump back. It's true that flexibility isn't everything, but what about if everyone else has got their legs over their heads and you haven't? This is Martina's uh, question. I'm actually going to revisit it because I want to say, not in my pieces. So I think that's what's really important. What kind of work do you want to do? Like I don't perform in work or choreograph work where people put their legs over their heads. Ever. I don't find it, it very yeah. interesting to watch. The thing is, like if, somebody, if you're in an audition- If that's the job you're going for, then yes, you need to be able to do it. If you want to be a Wayne McGregor dancer and you can't get your leg up near your head, then you're not going to get the job. But, but if you want to be in my company- But if you want matter. to do anything else, it's about the commitment to the movement. So I've seen pieces where people can get their legs up, but everything else is honestly just a little bit rubbish. Yeah. It's so, okay, I'm gonna so move on. I'm, we're like going super fast. And I, this, this is our life. There's me going a little bit faster than Kyle and dragging him along. Those of you that work with us know this is true. Um, okay, so Freya from Extinction. Hello, Freya, how What's are up, you? Um, so I wanted to ask about advice for a year out. Um, I think you just do again do what you want to do, do what you need to do. Don't panic. Time is on your side. You know, if you've, you've decided to take a year out and then go back to look at drama schools next year, no rush, really no rush. In fact, for drama school, you know, potentially age will really help you because you'll have even more maturity to offer the What course. you can do with a year out as well is that you can go in, I mean, it depends on your resources, funding, travel, whatever, but you can actually go and take other little courses. You can find like Easter, there's always Easter intensives, Christmas, winter intensives, summer workshops. So you workshops. can really broaden your experience and just enjoy, like, cause also, you know, training is very, very intense. For three years, you won't do anything else. You won't have a life, social life or anything like that. So actually being able to enjoy a little bit of sort of break from school, enjoy life a little bit before you kind of commit to that. I really wish I'd had a year out. I think I'd have yeah, but understood much better what to get out of my training if I'd done that. Mm. I'm, I'm different, I wouldn't have done that. I don't think, but it depends on what I've done previously. Yeah. So I think because I had, I think in a year out, look at what I said before. So um, physical literacy. So what else can you do? You might not need to do anything in dancing and acting. You could do, go work on a farm for a month because mm. that might help you understand a character or a movement pattern later on, you know? Yeah. So just do what you want to do. Yeah. And yeah, again, don't worry about time. You, you're not behind. Like, are you really, I mean, we both did our, Carl did his MSc and I did my MFA much later in life. We both did it in our 30s. So our master's um, degrees. Master's degrees, mine in choreography. And I now teach on the course that I uh, studied on. Carl, Carl now teaches on the course he studied on. Um, and that yeah. was fine. I mean, that was what he wanted to add to our skill set later in life. Um, we've talked about being behind, so there's like sort of struggling to pick up. So we're going to move over that question. We'll talk about improvisation. This is a question about body image. Do you think it's worth answering now? Yeah, I'll show sure. what's the question. Is now. it important to be skinny or slim? No. no. <laughs> And anyone that tells you otherwise, you know, I mean, yes, again, I understand that they are, if you're casting for certain roles, there may be a certain look they're going uh -huh. for, but globally to perform in this industry, you can be any body size or shape. Again, it depends what you want to do. Um, but I also think it's very important to be healthy, to understand the implications. If you decide that you want to be a certain kind of look, performer and therefore lose weight for that, then you should think about the implications. Look, you, you can't be somebody else. You, I can't be Rachel and Rachel can't be me. It's that, just stand up a second, just like, stand, just the height. <laughs> Look, if we stand over here, stand at the same position, 
Rachel can't be me and I can't be Rachel unless I want to just have no lower legs. Like a height thing is different. So we can't, we can't be each other. I don't want to spend a career trying to be Rachel. I can, I can aspire to what, to what she's thinking and her skill set, but we can't be physically, we can't be the same. But I do understand, I think, as a woman, as a teenage girl, all these things, but anyone. But oh, but as, as a man, so, so as for a man me, too. I, I'm long and gangly and skinny. I find it really difficult to look like a commercial dancer, like boom, muscly. Yeah. And I constantly struggle with that being like, oh, I wish I had a bit more, a bit more muscle, but it means changing my whole life to do, to do that. So I can focus on what I can give not what I think other people yeah. think. And if a job is, you know, if, you, if, you're, if a job is only wanting you because of the way you look, then I don't think it's the right job or the right course. I mean, if, a, if someone's trying to encourage you to change how you look rather than how you dance and what yeah. skills or what you bring, then that's not the right place. And I would just say, you know, Commit to the movement, away. not the image. Um, okay. Um, I... Okay, I'm going to answer one last question about, thank you for the, thank you for Lizanna, I don't know if I'm saying that right, who said our home decor is so nice, thank you. And I'm going to answer one last question, um, um, is that. about yeah. money, because we haven't talked about this yet. Um, this is a really expensive career, so Max has said about, you know, how difficult it is to afford to train in this, especially if you've been working a long time to save up, I, I feel you. Um, it's a really hard industry and I think it's getting harder, um, there's no easy answers there. Um, I will say that a lot of schools are, um, a lot of the conservatoires are affiliated with universities, so you get student loans and you have tuition fees paid through that route. So London Contemporary Dance School, Rombert, GSA, all these the schools, degree. anything where you get a degree, you're not paying the very high tuition fees, you're paying the same tuition fees that you would at a university and you get student loan and that kind yeah. of support. So that may be that you narrows your search to those sorts of courses. And actually yeah. many, you know, RADA, all these sorts so of places have so that. So it's conservatoire training, Conservatoire that has a degree program yeah. it means you can get government. So support. that makes it a lot easier. That obviously is all the other costs, which I understand, but it makes it a lot more affordable. And then in terms of starting out in a career, that's kind of another whole conversation, which I think we have to have another time. But um, so I think the main thing is, you know, some schools you are paying that, you know, thousands of pounds a term, and yeah. other other schools you're paying the sort of normal tuition fee. So look at that. Yeah. Um, and I've been working really hard with that max as well. So it's like this. It's just that uh, it's. That is the, the push, the struggle. Yeah. You're doing all the right stuff. The, the the thinking's in the right place, but again, looking for the support, which I'm I'm sure you've done many many times. But in terms of progressing forwards with with that, look at yeah student student loans and how that works as well. And I will say the final thing is it is really difficult to do this job financially, and you can't underestimate that. It comes with many other benefits. I mean, we wouldn't change what we've done for the world, and we have friends who've been lawyers and you know architects, and they've obviously had much greater income than us. But we've travelled the world, and we really enjoy our jobs. So if that's it, depends what's important to you. You know, if you feel like stability and security, and those things are really important, then maybe you don't follow this path. But if you, you know, if you're okay with some of those challenges, obviously as long as you're safe and healthy and all those sorts of things. There's often other scholarships you can look for, which again you're probably already looking at. But I don't. I currently don't know what scholarships are available, and it might be worth whichever kind of institutes you're looking at training at is to, is to ask the question is to say are there any student scholarships and who is eligible for them and that might be a thing to to look at as well yeah okay okay and i know that's not everything i'm sorry we didn't get through everything um a bit of a whistle stop um we actually nearly got to the end though oh when my did, god okay we're, we're gonna do the, three more okay okay um okay. <laughs> sorry tatiana definitely a stronger singer and actor than dancer i pick up choreography really quickly if you fall down as facial expressions and the advice for improving this Okay, um, so if you're saying that in dance you stop using your face but you're a good actor and singer, then there's some mismatch there, isn't there? Because you know how to use your face when you sing and act and it's like sometimes when you're dancing, you just forget. So actually you have those skills and you have that knowledge. You just need to apply it to your dance, not think of it as a separate skill set. All dancers struggle with this neutral dance face. I actually think it's brilliant that you identified you're, if it. If you're as saying it, if you're aware of it, you're already there. You're now already just, ahead of the game. Just be aware. For me, it's making sure I just kind of go, mm-hmm. I raise an eyebrow, half a smile, and just go. Okay. Oh, I thought I was thinking it was during during dancing. Yeah. All right. So you do That's... you raise an eyebrow when you're dancing? Yeah. And give half a smile to the audience. Yeah, because half. Yeah. yeah. All right. Because <laughs> usually I'm struggling, and the way I survive going through having this kind of face that is just constant, like oh, I'm doing so bad, is I find the comedy in my struggle. So I, I go, you know what? I oh, I can't pick it up, but it means that I'm engaging with the material. I'm not just kind of like focusing it on myself. And That's it's remembering funny. that this is part of your body, so you know how to use all this. So you know how to use this. Don't just 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 don't um, separate into two separate things. That's easier said than Connect done. Connect with the class. Um, okay.
Um, really passionate about ballet, I just started it. Um, it, so Amelie was saying that basically you started ballet recently, you then sort of basically realised that you feel like you may be a little bit behind and you took a class, a dance day with Central and realised that so everyone else was ahead of you. Carl's perfect dance this because... <laughs> I started ballet when I was 15, 14 or 15, as a tall, lanky boy. And my first ballet class was with the little people doing good toes, naughty toes. So it was like small people, tall person, small people. <laughs> And it was, I, you feel constantly behind. It's not. I can't, uh, you should you, see the first ballet assessment. It's hilarious. Tell you what, actually, look at <laughs> Misty Copeland. She's a uh, principal with American Ballet Theatre or New York City Ballet. I can't um, she, oh, just Google Misty Copeland because yeah. she started dance, I think, about 14 or 15. And she's probably one of the top ballet dancers in the, in the world. Yeah. Um, it's, yes, it'll take you longer. You can't, you can't make up five years of training in one year. So, yes, you might be a year behind now, but you're obviously good. I mean, you're obviously committed and that means that you will catch up. It just might take you that year or two longer. So don't panic and look up Misty Copeland. Yeah. Um, is it important to learn an instrument? It's a nice thing to do. It, it, I, it's not something that usually comes up in a dance audition unless it's for um, musical theatre or sort of um, actor muso jobs. Yeah, it, um, it's good to have an extra skill, but I don't think- It's not I, important, I can, in my opinion. I can play little bits of lots of things. And by little bits, I mean I can pick it up and look like I'm about to play something and then But not. we never have used it in I've our never, professional careers. No. I do read music and that has really helped me work in opera music so that I can read a score. Yeah. But that's a very valuable skill, which has got me work. Um, maybe, essential maybe, for BYMT. It's essential really for good. BYMT, maybe less as a dancer, but maybe as a choral forward or some movement director that can be useful. It's not the most important thing. Tips for dance in drama school auditions. I think we've covered all of that. I mean- Stand in the middle, stand engage, middle engage. engage with people. Don't try um, and do any things like wear a bright colour. That's it. Doesn't listen matter. Listen to what's being asked as well. Yes. Like if the panel says we're really interested in how you move, don't do a sort of like summary of the routine you learnt last week from your teacher, which includes lots of steps with names like pirouette and tondu and jeté. Because mm. they listen to what they've asked. If they say show us your skill and your technique and your previous experience, then that's fine. You know, show those skills, but really listen. Don't assume that you know you have to do anything from prior like really listen to what's being asked There's so many people you know i think i've just told you not to do that and you've just done it so that's also you know that goes against you whereas if i see you trying that and often there will be time later for you to show your skill or show your creativity if they say yeah. be brave then be brave be as brave as you can um and the last question the very 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 that's very last done. question was any acting skills you recommend to learn specifically nothing specific but i think it's really good as a dancer to have some acting training i think it's where our industry is going dance theater fusion work musical theater all these skills are important so anything you can do to just understand the actor's process and feel comfortable talking on stage you know short courses online workshops that has to be a good thing but again it depends what you want to do with your career yeah oh my god that was exhausting um <laughs> I enjoyed it. Thank you very much, everyone. I hope we did answer everything. If we didn't, please tweet at BYMT or post on Instagram or Facebook, whatever, and we will answer those questions. That's Anna. That thank you for the extra time. Yes. Hope that's not kind of challenged anything else. Sorry. Um, Sorry. And um, we hope to see many of you joining B at BYMT this summer or in the future. So we hope we get to work with lots of you in years yeah. to come. Okay. Thanks All right, very much. Everybody. Thanks Bye. a lot. Bye.